Welcome everyone uh, in this uh, lecture series, this India plus AVM lecture series. So uh, as usual, like each week we have uh, been discussing one physics topic from uh, multiple high energy heavy ion experiments. So in the second uh, part of our series, we have been discussing on uh, the global analysis. So in the past week, we have uh, discussed the global analysis from a star and Elise. And this week we have uh, Professor Gabor Ferres will be discussing on uh, the results on uh, global event properties of hadrons and ion uh, collisions by CMS. So in this lecture, uh, the speaker will have uh, one hour to speak. So uh, during the talk, please uh, try to keep your questions uh, to the minimum. But if you have any pressing question, you can uh, raise your hand and speak up. And uh, at the end of the talk, we'll have about uh, 30 minutes of question and answer session. So, so you can uh, keep posting your question and comments to the chat and we'll take it over after the seminar is done. And this seminar is uh, being live streamed and recorded. So if you don't want your question and answer to be recorded, we can take that uh, at the end of our uh, seminar. So with this, uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Veres to take it over. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me check if you can hear me well. Yes, can we can. You, yes, okay. So thank you for the invitation for this uh, seminar series. Um, uh, my, my topic is uh, global event properties. And I extended a little bit the topic, not only uh, mentioning heavy ions, but also <clears throat> proton-proton collisions. And, and the reason is that uh, there are two reasons. One is that we always, or at least I always think about heavy ions uh, as, um, as a, a complex uh, a part of, uh, of physics, which is very much connected to elementary, more elementary collisions. And one of the, one of the main ideas of, of my research during my career was to try to compare heavy ions to more elementary particles, starting from my, my thesis when I was a student. So <clears throat> I very rarely talk about heavy ions without, without protons. And the second reason is simply that I was involved in, in most of the work that, uh, that I will talk about Today, not all of them, but, but most of them, I was involved in one way or another, so I'm more familiar with this. Um, and hopefully I will remember, because I have to rely on my memory, some of these measurements we started quite some time ago, and maybe it is really a good idea to, to refresh these memories now. So let's start with this picture. Um, from CMS. This is one of the first collisions between heavy ions and, and it's just thinking about how difficult it is to measure something like this with a, with a large experiment that was not designed for heavy ions is, is really amazing. So please note that uh, the previous lecture by, by Starr and Ellis, uh, they, they are they are experiments that were designed for heavy ion collisions. And let me just mention that CMS is absolutely not designed for heavy ion collisions. And it is really not uh, self-evident that CMS can measure heavy ions. We have started this program sometime around 2002, 2005 uh, in CMS uh, with the plans to measure heavy ions. and we had to uh, we have to convince the collaboration that uh, that we will try and we will be able to do interesting physics with cms with heavy ions and now thinking about it everybody knows that cms is a great experiment for heavy ions but it was not at all clear to people uh, something like 20 years ago so the problem is that uh, Sometimes 50,000 particles are key, being created in a heavy ion collision. You have to try to measure all of them uh, with a with a silicon system with colorimeters, and and this is more than what uh, 
what proton proton even with high pile of proton proton collisions can produce. So so this is really challenging and and especially challenging if you want to measure something precisely or some uh, final states that are uh, influenced by this huge amount of underlying event, for example, jets. Um, so maybe I will mention some of these difficulties. So the outline of the talk, I will go back a little bit in history because of this global event characteristics analysis. Um, I, I, I want to highlight how this comes about. So when we started the CMS program in heavy ions, we had already experience uh, uh, from uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, the RIG accelerator, and we, we had some ideas what will be interesting to measure and, and we prepared for something, but we got also very surprised about some, some other things. So this is really interesting. And, and when uh, some of you or whoever listens to this talk, uh, we'll face the situation when you have to um, do something first in a new experiment in the future, in some time from now. This is really maybe interesting uh, experience that I, I try to mention here about the these historical things. So I will mention charged particle distributions and, and limiting fragmentation, which was a long time ago <clears throat> uh, known before uh, before uh, uh, the RIC accelerator started, but uh, it became again interesting to study this uh, in the beginning of the century. Then I will show some selected CMS results on these global properties, and I select. I I don't want to collect all these analyses, and I was really asked by the organizers not to just collect all the analyses by uh, by uh, by topic and just mention all of this uh, in a rush. So I, I just picked a few where I will try to highlight a few difficulties with these measurements and how to do these measurements, how to think about doing such measurements and uh, not only to, to show the results. So I will not, it's not like a, a conference talk where, where we really have to put in all the recent results. I don't, I didn't even keep in mind putting in a recent results because I want to, I want to show something about the methodology of these measurements. So the first one is the charge particle distributions. Then, and I will talk about angular correlations, a little bit about diffraction and inelastic cross section and the charge exchange, which may be a new thing, but uh, these are not separate topics. I was also surprised about this first that when I tried to do some measurements, Many other things come into play, which I didn't even expect. And we have to learn something about other things before, before we do a measurement, uh, which looked uh, very simple at first. So I will not explain in detail the CMS experiment uh, because many other speakers probably did that. But I want to mention a few things which are especially important for heavy ions and one of them is uh, is the totem detectors or the totem collaboration, uh, or nowadays uh, they are working together with, uh, with CMS. But uh, anyway, the, the detectors can be quite important for many physics topics, including heavy ions. Uh, these are detectors at very large pseudo rapidities compared to the central detector. So they measure, they are very close to the beam and they measure particles that are close to the beam. We have also the Castor colorimeter. The Castor colorimeter covered between 5.2 and 6.6 .6 of pseudo rapidity. And, uh, and uh, this was a relatively small, small detector. Basically, you can imagine a tabletop detector size but uh, it is still the deposited energy of the particles that came out of the collision was the largest in this region when the Castor perimeter was placed. Uh, probably I could give a separate talk about Castor measurements and how interesting it is. I, I participated in a technical paper describing Castor, but I don't want to focus on it too much today. 
ZDC is the zero degree colorimeter. It's a really nice device, very, very uh, far from the interaction point, more than 100 meters, and it measures neutral particles that travel basically almost at the same direction as the beam. Um, they are not deflected by the magnets, so we can measure them uh, downstream. For heavy ions, it's very when, when we talk about the heavy ion program with a detector that was not designed for it, we have to appreciate the, 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 the capabilities. We have a silicon tracker system with big cells and strips um, with a very large data coverage. Now, everybody says that, but it's really important when you want to measure long range correlations, for example, uh, correlations between particles that are very far away in angle. Then we have electromagnetic and hadronic colorimeters. Okay, everybody knows that, but it's really important to have these if you want to measure jets. And it's not, it was at that time not really clear uh, how well um, and how successfully and how precisely we can measure jets in heavy ion collisions with 50,000 other particles being created. We have the muon chambers. This is extremely important for heavy ions because the, some of the most interesting particles for heavy ions, like the epsilon uh, states uh, or uh, or the, the psi states, they, they decay uh, to two muons, and these muons can be measured by the muon chambers. Uh, extension with forward detectors is also important. Maybe we will see some of the examples. But let me just point out. Uh, one detector, the Hadron forward colorimeter. The Hadron forward colorimeter, you could see on this picture uh, on the very right, uh, this orange box. This is not really a box, it's a cylinder, and a physicist is being placed set standing next to it. So it's a huge device in itself. It measures energy of the Hadrons by absorption and uh, and uh, what I want to emphasize here, if, if you want to uh, become a good uh, experimentalist, you have to be very close to detectors and probably participate in some of the construction of the detectors. This is actually the first detector I, I was working on when I was a student. Um, and I participated in the design of this detector a little bit. My design was not accepted. Another design was accepted, which was, however, very similar. And part of the detector was built in uh, in Budapest, where I am speaking from. Um, Budapest is a relatively big city in a very small country, and uh, and uh, what we could do is just a part of this job. And our our job was to place these quartz fibers, these tiny fibers inside the uh, steel absorbers that you can see here. And what I mean is really, really meticulous work and that needs a lot of patience. And this patience is also needed for the data analysis. So, so this is one of the detectors I, I came to contact with. Okay, so let's, let's go to global event properties. What were the early questions when we started this CMS heavy ion program? And in general, heavy ions, for example, one question is what is the energy that is released in a collision? This is related to the energy density that is being created when heavy ions collide. And this energy density is an important parameter. If, if this is high enough, then the expectation from, from theory is that the, the protons and neutrons don't, be, don't stay intact, but they disintegrate. And, uh, and how much is this energy is important? And it depends on it. You can measure something like this by, okay, with a few assumptions, but by measuring how many particles are created and, and uh, what is the energy or momentum or transverse momentum of these particles that are created. One question that you can ask is, are these ions transparent and how much transparent? Can they just fly through each other or they stop when they collide or something in between? Uh, this is a question that is not entirely obvious. 
if they just if they are trans if they will be transparent there will be no energy created in the center uh, so are the baryons stopped in heavy and collisions or not uh, what is the number and momentum of these particles that are created what is the total cross section the elastic and inelastic cross section and diffractive cross section of these processes uh, are, are these particles in correlation with each other this is a global property because you can not only uh, learn about two particles when you do two particle correlations but you can learn about the collective motion of these particles when you do that and is there saturation at low you can x at high rapidities or not this is something that that influences all these measurements perhaps so all these questions were summarized by one of my talks a uh, long time ago i will not go through them again they are all related to each other in some way and just thinking about gluon saturation quickly when you uh, when you decrease uh, the the uh, the moment of fraction of the partons or or you you increase the uh, the momentum transfer you you can have this uh, uh, you have this prediction of of the gluons in 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 hadrons being more and more close to each other and we know that gluons in in theory uh, can can interact with each other and fuse with each other so that that may lead to experimentally visible saturation effects for that, we need to discuss a little bit of the kinematics. Of course, everyone uh, of you probably knows that, but I still summarized it here. Uh, when we talk about rapidity um, or pseudo rapidity, these are very similar quantities. And uh, these are longitudinal quantities, but the simplest longitudinal quantity is the momentum component that is parallel to the beam, which is called PZ, because Z is the axis pointing to the beam. And T is transverse to that. So <coughs> the PC uh, is related to the sine hyperbolic of the rapidity uh, and also the sine hyperbolic, hy hyperbolic function of the, of the super rapidity. Uh, you just have to multiply them by transverse momentum or transverse mass, which is the square root of mass squared plus uh, transverse momentum squared. And they are all equal to prime on X. Uh, divided by two times the root s which is the available energy in the collision so something like this and and uh, we'll discuss about this x a little bit this x is used and these quantities are used in in the pronostic scattering and uh, when you want to go to low x where these gluons are likely saturating then you have to go to high eta to calculate it so let's look at some measurements, early measurements before CMS, which inspired a lot of CMS measurements um, about this low X and uh, saturation. So we we had uh, before CMS an uh, experiment which is called Phobos. And Phobos is not anymore operating, but it started at the same time as STAR uh, at RIC. And, um, and what you can see here is gold, gold, and copper, copper, and the deuteron gold collisions, uh, eta distributions, so there are distributions, different energies. So this plot summarizes a lot of lot of measurements, and uh, it's a large collection. And uh, as I mentioned, the high eta region is very, very well measured by uh, by Phobos. Now, the reason I show this because I want to connect these measurements to CMS, because the first CMS measurement was done exactly or almost exactly the same way as these heavy ion measurements are done. Uh, and this is just basically a single layer of, of silicon detector, and we count how many hits, how many clusters or signals we get from this single layer of silicon. So it's a very simple measurement in principle, but it also has some challenges. Now, this is a large collection of data, but how to, uh, in physics, we always try to, to make some order between measurements, try to try to find some scaling variable or, or something that we can, uh, we can more um, categorize uh, according to some expectations, or maybe not even according to some expectations, but, but some empirical effects and scaling. 
So one possibility is to shift all these eta distributions to um, to the rest frame of one of the beams. And if we do that, so basically we change from the laboratory system, coordinate system to a system which flies with the same speed as one of the beams. Or you can say it's a fixed target experiment. So you just have a beam and you hit another ion is the same same thing. And uh, and when you then you plot uh, the D and the eta distributions, the charge particle eta distributions on top of each other at different energies. And what you can see is that really they lie on a limiting curve, which is which is a, like a scaling curve, and it doesn't matter what your your energy is. It all it always starts same way. Um, you can even make detailed plots by by dividing peripheral and central collisions. Uh, if you can measure centrality, which is probably a topic of another talk, maybe, and uh, and then then you can really see that it's energy independent. So this is very interesting. This is one of the few examples where um, by just doing a measurement and thinking about how to present your data, you can probably point to some some uh, something interesting, even without predictions. This is one of my favorite, uh, maybe one of my favorite features of heavy ion collisions that predictions are often not very precise. However, what you do with the data is up to your creativity, creativity uh, maybe much more than, than in uh, high energy physics where you have a lot of very precise predictions and prescriptions of what to do if you are an experimentalist. So some, um, intuitive interpretation of this that you have, if you increase the energy, you have the beam energy increasing, then you have a Lorentz contracted ion uh, with a higher and higher energy, higher and higher uh, Lorentz contraction, relativistic contraction, and then basically uh, you reach uh, you reach uh, the, the 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 region where you where your gluons are saturating. Your your ion will look like a more and more flat uh, objects because of this Lorentz contraction, and. Uh, if you if you look at this plot, you can maybe make a prediction even, which is not a theoretical prediction, an experimental prediction of how. Uh, yeah, let me just jump through this. How how this will look like at at LHC, or in in in, in specific uh, terms in CMS. So, <clears throat> what you can see here is uh, just a little uh, pretty naive uh, extrapolation from the data from Phobos at higher and higher energy. And at that time, we were thinking that the energy of the ion collisions will be 5.5 TeV. So that is the blue line and uh, other theoretical predictions. And you can see that uh, uh, we, we use the fact that there is this, this plateau in rapidity and there is this limiting curve and basically uh, Based on our measurements, we predict some experimental value for for the LHC energy. Um, what I want to show here is how much these predictions differ from each other. So this is not a very not a very precise uh, field of, of of science. If you think about predictions of multiplicity, it's almost a factor of five or six or seven difference between these predictions. And this in itself is interesting. Okay, um, not only uh, charge particle distributions have this type of scaling, but other variables, which is interesting, like the V1 coefficient of the Fourier uh, expansion of the angular uh, angle distribution, the, the azimuthal angle distribution, but I don't want to go too much in detail to that, it's just, showing you that is not the only example. So let's come to CMS. CMS started with a measurement that it was not really designed for. And let me just say this, that CMS is designed for a billion collisions a second. 
and it can handle in an excellent way such a high luminosity. But how to handle luminosity that is so low that you have to wait seconds for just one collision to happen? This is not at all easy, and, and, and CMS uh, was not uh, really designed for that, and people didn't foresee such a situation, although uh, when LAC started up in uh, 2009, in 23rd of November, in the evening, uh, the first proton-proton collision happened. We really wanted to do something interesting with it. So let me just point out how we did that. Uh, on, on this picture on the left side, you can see the beam pipe coming to the Hadron forward colorimeter that I already talked about. And on the face of this colorimeter, you can see these trapezoid shapes and the ring, the blue ring. And these trapezoids and the blue ring are scintillators, which were not foreseen to be put in CMS. Uh, it was put there by oh, just a few people, including me. Uh, it was saved from uh, being thrown away from another experiment. And we connected some cables to the CMS trigger system, and we could use it as a trigger. And that trigger played a major role for at least half a year for all of the first CMS papers to have uh, event selection and collision selection. So you can see me in front of CMS and one of the first collisions. So this is our detector. It's called the beam scintillator counters. And basically we have set up many different triggers with it. We have set up a minimum bias trigger, which could very, very sensitively measure already the first couple of collisions that happened in LHC. We have set up a high multiplicity trigger with it, which required a lot of different segments of the scintillator to, to, to fire at the same time. And most importantly, perhaps a little technical, but we set up a veto trigger for beam gas collisions. The problem is if the luminosity is so low, then most of what happens in CMS is beam gas collisions. The protons don't hit each other, but they hit uh, another nucleus in the not perfect vacuum of the, of the beam pipe. And so this will be a fixed target collision, which we are not interested in. And, and it will contain particles that fly parallel to the beam. Uh, and we have to veto for that. So based on the timing of this, uh, timing of these signals coming from the left and right side of the interruption point, you could figure out if a particle, particles hit this detector starting from the center where the time difference is zero, or they come from the one side of the CMS experiment when the time difference is not zero. So that is, sounds very simple, but uh, it took a very careful work to integrate this into the trigger system. And, and what is the reason for that? Um, well, there is another, device, which is the beam pickup detectors, where, where you, can, you can trigger on zero bias collisions, which means you only trigger on incoming bunches and you don't require a collision or anything. And maybe collision doesn't even happen, but you still trigger on it. Now, if the chance to have a collision is much, much less than one, 10 to the minus three, for example, then it will be very inefficient, inefficient to use such a trigger because then uh, 999 events will be empty or just uh, beam gas um, and no collisions and only one out of thousand collisions will have a collision. So this zero bias trigger is only useful for medium, moderate intensity, moderate uh, luminosity. I'm starting, I'm talking about the startup of CMS, not today where, we, where you have a billion collisions every second. Um, and, and so if, if the luminosity is really low, then you need a minimum bias trigger, which means you need to somehow tell your trigger system that a collision happened. So we, for example, we prepared for this, for example, we're thinking if we require at least one track in the pixel detector, 
that will be a very low bias because almost all collisions will have at least one track so you don't select too strongly your collisions and we calculated the efficiency for inelastic and non-diffractive and double diffractive and single diffractive collisions um, and the problem is in cms that you cannot really trigger on tracks on the level one uh, trigger level because uh, because the level one trigger system needs to decide if the event is interesting before the tracking runs. So it's only possible at the edge. So we, we had this various plans. I don't want to go into the details. You can look at the slides later about this. And we already prepared for our measurement in very great detail. Um, we prepared for different methods. Uh, we increased the, the capabilities of the tracking algorithm to accept uh, very low PT tracks because most of the multiplicity of the text comes from very low PT. And you can see that we made studies where even each pixel plays a role and, and we studied in great detail how to, how to reconstruct text at a very low PT. Okay, so this is how the data taking uh, happened for this analysis. It was about 10 Hertz of collisions. So a very low luminosity and basically no pileup because the 10 hertz means they they happen very rarely the trigger system was uh, accepting uh, was set up uh, for the beam scintillator counters so they had to give a signal and the beam pickups as well so that we filter the noise from the scintillators and the event selection required also some energy in the hf color emitters which i mentioned in the beginning and uh, Based on Monte Carlo simulations, we could estimate the non-single diffractive uh, efficiency and uh, as a function of charge particle multiplicity and so on. What was really amazing that the energy loss in the tracker in the already in the first days almost exactly matched the Monte Carlo simulation. There was no noise and no surprises about that it was an excellent pixel system, silicon pixel system. We also reconstructed the vertices of the collisions, so the collision points, and the collision points are distributed along Z and exactly as we expected, the nice Gaussian distributions. Uh, we also studied the number of pixels uh, that were hit by the same particles, so they follow each other in the three layers of the pixel system that was there in the beginning and uh, the number of strip tracker hits along the track up to 20 and they all match really well the the first data really well match, matches the, the the monte carlo so we could already see that the heat reconstruction efficiency is higher than 99 percent with a very low noise, basically noise-free detector. So if we see, if we saw any signals there that came from particles, but we still had to be really careful with these particles because some of them were not primaries and were not coming from collisions. And this is how we separated them. So it's called the cluster counting method. It's exactly the same as in the Phobos experiment I showed you earlier. So you plot uh, the, if you have a highly segmented pixel uh, detector, silicon pixel detector, then you can uh, cluster your hits so you can count how long is a hit. So, for example, it's not only one pixel is hit, but five or six or ten uh, consecutive pixels are hit by the same particle, so they form a long cluster. And and of course, these these layers are parallel to the beam, they are long cylinders. So if your eta, if your pseudo rapidity is, is high, your crossing angle of the particle through your detector is shallow, then through, due to this shallow angle, many pixels are hit after each other in the same cluster. So that this is how you get this cosine hyperbolic shape of the experimental data, which tells you that the real good tracks that you are looking for they are above this black line, they are above the cut, and, and whatever is below, they are fake. They, are, they don't belong there, so you should not analyze them uh, because they are too short for their angle. 
for their crossing angle. So this really looks like a very, very simple method to measure the number of particles you have, have because there are many problems with this. First of all, what if, what if your detector is noisy? Of course, then you are in a trouble, but it's, it was not noisy. Uh, you have to still correct for particles that are looping around in the magnetic field because we couldn't turn off the magnetic field. Later, we, we, we did measurements with zero field, but not in the beginning. So these loopers came about and they crossed the layer many times. There are weak decays and secondaries that you don't want to count. Um, but in, the, in, in turn, you have three layers and independent results for all the layers. You don't need to have an alignment of your detector. You don't even have to know by more than a, a few millimeters precision where your detector is, which is a very big advantage if you have the first measurement in the experiment. And the problem is you are very sensitive to beam background. So you really have to treat this well. Because of the beam background, we prepared another method, which is the tracklet method. Very, very simple. Uh, here you can see two layers on this little cartoon, uh, two layers of the silicon, and hits on it, the blue and red dots. And you try to connect these pairwise such that uh, they all point to the same place. If they all point to the same place, that, that was the collision point, and you have your tracklets. Those tracklets that are not compatible with this direction, they are rejected. <clears throat> so this is the uh, one of the control plots. We had the, the difference in pseudo rapidity between the two hits and the two layers. And if the track was really straight or high PT, then it should be zero. It should have the same angle uh, uh, looking from the collision point, and it has a tail. And all this tail and the peak is very well described by, by the Monte Carlo. These tails are coming from secondaries, decays of particles that are not anymore pointing back to the collision point. Okay, so I don't want to go into more details about this, but we have, of course, the tracking, and the tracking was really optimized to low PT. And if you compare to Alice or Star, it is not quite as low PT as in their experiment because we had a four Tesla magnetic field, and it was really difficult to go down because of the loopers. But we did a very good job starting already at 150 MeV on this plot. So we could measure 150 MeV particles, which uh, in CMS, nobody believed bef possible before these type of studies became important for the first paper. So this is one of our results. It just simply shows you the first collisions, uh, first features of collisions of PT distribution at 900 GeV and 2.36 TeV. Uh, this data was collected just within a few hours. And uh, as expected, the PT distributions become flatter, or sometimes we call them harder as a function of collision energy. And the D and the eta results uh, with the different colors, the different, uh, different symbols, uh, the different uh, methods, the cluster counting, the tracklet and the full tracking methods, they agree very well. And it was important to have three methods, otherwise the, the collaboration would not approve these results if you just have one method and one, one result, and then there is no real cross-check of uh, what you are doing. This also nicely agreed, by the way, with the Ellis and, and UA5 from Tevatron, which is a 900 G if it was possible to, to compare, so it's great. So one of one of the one of the lessons I learned is that when we have a new accelerator, we really have to cross-check at the same energy as was already achieved at the previous accelerator. A few things, and if everything is okay, we can continue. Uh, the energy dependence of this mean PT uh, you can see there, and and the and the D and the eta dependence on root S. Uh, so as a function of collision energy, and and the models really. Uh, disagree with each other. Uh, I don't want to go into details about that, but you can see that by measuring it precisely, you could narrow down the possible range of model parameters or even, even models uh, very much. 
uh, the new new points are the red dots here. Okay, so we repeated the whole analysis at 7 TV again with the with the same trigger using the BHC, uh, these beam scintillator counters for cleaning of the events and triggering on them. Otherwise, you would have lost these events probably. And uh, we used 55,000 events with a very high 86% efficiency for non single diffractive collisions. I will come back to what this means a little bit because uh, because we didn't really expect to that we had to deal with the, the diffraction, but in the end we have to deal with diffraction if we just want to measure average events. How do we reject beam gas events? I didn't uh, mention so far. Uh, we have not only the BSC timing veto, but we had the cluster size along the beam. And when we uh, look at the cluster size along the beam, uh, it has to be as a function of the Z position of the cluster, a V shape, because the further away your hit is from col the collision point, proportionally larger the, your, your cluster should be. So we had this V shape and we move it along the Z to find the position where it contains the most of the hits. And that we call the, the 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 correct position for the for the collision point in this in this plot it's minus four centimeters, and we calculated the the ratio of clusters inside this uh, this uh, V shape and outside, uh, or or actually inside, but uh, but but when we offset the V shape by plus minus ten centimeter, and this ratio tells you how clean your your uh, your collision is, and uh, the real collisions have this high ratio. The compatibility between the vertex and the cluster shape is high um, on the right plot. And you can place a cut and remove the, be the beam gas events, which have a lot of pixel hits, but very much ill-defined vertex. So this is, again, something to, to remember that uh, that uh, once you have your data in hand at a very low level, like the, 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 the shapes of your clusters, maybe it's not comfortable to you to, to think about it, but, uh, but if you have some information from your detector that people usually don't use, and you have a good idea, a creative idea, and a useful idea, then, then you should follow up because it may it may become important in, in, in the future analysis. Now, why I'm talking about diffraction? Because that influences the result. Uh, if you want to measure how many particles are created in a collision, you have to say, okay, um, what type of collision you mean? Um, in elastic collision, uh, where at least one particle is created or, or um, do you include the diffractive events where, uh, for example, one of the protons survived the collision and the other one disintegrates diffractively at very, very low angles? Most, most people are not interested in those. Uh, or you specify your cross-section or, or, or values for non-diffractive events, so you have to decide that. But in the end, what it comes down to is you have to estimate the fraction of diffractive events and non diffractive events in your sample. And this is just a nice plot that shows you how you can try to do that. Uh, we have a variable here, this sum E plus PZ. It's a variable that is characteristic to whether your event is diffractive or not. If it is, then, then it's very small. So just to simplify it a bit. And you have this peak at zero. And that, that is described by, 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 by the Monte Carlo model PTO very well, but only if you adjust by hand a single number, which is the diffractive cross-section built in PTO. If you adjust it very well, then it describes your data. And this is actually how you can measure, how you can try to measure diffraction uh, in data uh, if you take a model that is a very good model, but only one three parameter, then you can adjust it to match the data. And once you adjusted this, you can use this model to estimate 
what is the fraction of different types of events in your selected sample, because now you know that your model describes the data and even describes the fraction. It's amazing to look at this plot that shows you how excellent is the agreement between the cluster charge between data and, and models. Cluster charge is, uh, I didn't mention it before, it's very useful to identify particles. And you have this series of lectures about particle identification. Uh, so I will not go into that. Uh, if we compare two models, what we got the mean PT and the DND as a function of root S, then we see that most of the model tunes underestimated the, the number of particles at 7 TeV by a pretty large factor on the right side of the plot. Um, if you want to study and observe single diffractive events even more, then you can use this variable and you can use you know, more serious comparison, a lot of different models with different diffraction built in two different energies. And you can even enhance your diffractive, uh, the number of diffractive events if you place certain cuts, so like on this plot. So anyway, you can imagine how, how you can do that. Now, what about heavy ions? Heavy ions already offer something, already offered in the in the first uh, few measurements of first few weeks or months of the heavy ion program in CMS, some surprises. For example, the red dots here uh, on the left are the uh, multiplicity measurement results as a function of the number of participating nucleons, basically the centrality of the collision. Uh, and in CMS. And when we compare to lower energy data, then we see the same structure, the same shape. Maybe this is an accident, but uh, it was absolutely not, not uh, expected to be like that because CMS has much higher energy and much higher contribution of jets and mini jets to this total number of collisions. And the cross section of these jets is increasing much, much st more strongly than the general soft particle production as a function of energy. So, if anything, we we expected a steeper distribution because in central collisions on the right side of the plot, these uh, uh, number of binary collisions and number of jets should be relatively much higher than in peripheral collisions. So they should not scale with n part. So anyway, one could talk a lot about this, this result and how surprising it is already when we look at global features. Same is true for transverse energy density. Let me just show you this plot. The transverse energy, or the, actually the total energy density as a, as a function of eta, so how much energy is released from the collision, is measured using the colorimeters and including the Castor colorimeter, which is a very, very high eta, or in this case, it's around minus six because it's only on one side of the experiment. And you can happily study uh, saturation with it because when you look at these curves, they look similar at first, but when you make a ratio, then you notice that uh, as a function of centrality, their ratio is much steeper at uh, zero pseudo rapidity than close to the beam at high rapidity. So that is again a, is a sign of saturation and uh, and you didn't do much more than just look at uh, global features of the collision and you can already conclude interesting physics from it. One other topic, uh, if you look at just global features of collisions is elliptic flow. Elliptic flow is, I, I feel it's a, it's, a, it's a topic for another seminar. It's a very complicated and very large topic but I want to show it since this is also a global feature of the collision. So basically you measure uh, how, what is the distribution of, of particles emitted from the collision as a function of azimuthal angle. But what is interesting, you can measure that by two particle correlations, because if this uh, azimuthal distribution is not uniform, then your two, part, two, two particle angular difference uh, uh, distribution will also not be uniform. So it will inherit a second order effect, but it's very precisely measurable. And this is a method that I really liked uh, in the early 
days of the global analysis program in CMS. And just for just for uh, just showing one of the first results, it's the higher order Fourier components are also measurable with the with the high precision in CMS. The the black points are the V two, which is the cosine uh, two phi uh, uh, component of the Fourier expansion of the azimuthal angle distribution, but you have the higher order covalence, so the higher order uh, coefficients as well. Now, why that is important again? So it contains a lot of physics, a lot of dynamics, a lot of things like energy loss in the quadrant plasma, uh, the uh, pressure gradients created in the quadrant plasma, and you can say a lot of things about that, but one experimental thing is important uh, that when you want to measure jets, these asymmetric underlying event distributions provide a background for your jet that you need to subtract to learn about the energy of your jet. If you don't do it properly, then you will mislead yourself if you want to measure the jet energy. So how to measure jet energy when you have a huge number of particles uh, all over the place, you, you can do that iteratively. That was one of our earliest ideas. Just measure, you just find the jets and outside of your jet, you average the energy per unit area in this eta phi plot, and then you subtract it and you find the jet again. And iteratively, you can find the energy of the jet. So that was from our technical design report, but uh, of course you can be more fancy about that. But one of the first results to be shown is, uh, is not maybe a global feature, but a global feature uh, can influence this if you are not careful. It is the, the jet energy loss or jet quenching paper. We have almost uh, 900 citations of this paper by now. And you can see this famous two jets in the eight of five plane with very different, a factor of three different energy. So basically this asymmetry, these are back-to-back -back jets uh, against each other in phi. Um, so it, it all, almost never happens if you look at proton-proton collisions, but in heavy ions it does, and it leads to very interesting physics conclusions. But let's come back to global features. So I mentioned two particle correlations. Why are two particle correlations one of my favorite? Uh, CM, one reason is that CMS has this extremely delicate silicon system with a very high eta coverage. So you can do these measurements in an excellent way. Uh, so let's uh, look at it. So if you have, we just choose two particles and you randomly, and you plot uh, the distribution of the delta eta between them and the delta phi, then you get these tent shape distributions. You can think about why is it a tent shape? Uh, and there is a little peak on the top at zero, zero, probably because of the jets. They come, they produce particles that are very close to each other. Now, this is your signal. On the left side, you can mix uh, different events and you can make the same plot, but at, at this time, uh, the two particles that you choose, they come from different collisions. They have nothing to do with each other. They, of course, will not create this little peak. So when you make a ratio between signal and background, then you have this structure on the bottom, and this has a lot of interesting features. For example, you have short range correlations, which are particles created very close to each other in eta. And these are of course resonances or string, string fragmentation clusters. Uh, you can have different interpretations of this, but uh, decaying particles definitely will do that. There will be some lower PT clusters where your particles can, can escape the collision point at large uh, azimuthal angle differences and high PT clusters, which force the particles fly close to each other. Uh, at the near side, you have a jet peak, which is correlated particles within a jet, very close to each other within a single jet. You have uh, the array side jet uh, correlation, which is a uh, back-to-back -back jet correlation. And because of some interesting features of the protons, uh, they will be elongated in delta eta. 
not uh, concentrated in a small delta eta region. And uh, looking at the peak, you have both the Einstein correlations there, which are quantum correlations, which affect uh, identical particles that are very close to each other. And it's also the whole picture is uh, influenced by momentum conservation, which is uh, this cosine shape. Now, a lot of, lot of features. And let's look at the data in CMS on the top. Proton-proton data tells you is something very similar to what the models tell you. So nothing exciting so far. But if you, in addition, look at high multiplicity proton-proton collisions, which are very close to heavy ion collisions in terms of multiplicity, number of particles, uh, then you can see something interesting. I didn't uh, mention that, but in order to trigger on high multiplicity events, CMS had to devote 50% of the CPU time of the AHRT trigger system for this uh, without a very certain justification of what kind of discovery will come out of it. So because of the flexibility of CMS, we could measure high multiplicity events. Okay, with the trigger, I will not go into detail, a factor of thousand times more events than with the minimum bias trigger. And if you look at high multiplicity, then, uh, then you you start to observe something interesting uh, around zero delta phi and high delta eta, which is called a rich structure. Here you can see the rich structure at a PT slot of one to three GeVs at high multiplicity. And that is something that is not there in mean bias collisions and also not there in in, uh, in 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 physics models. So <clears throat> we learned something interesting about particles as a global feature of the collision. And this is my illustration for this effect. So collision happens in the center and two particles escape and they prefer to come out in this case, they prefer to come out in the same time zone but they are very far from each other, maybe different hemispheres, and they still talk to each other. They still somehow know about which direction one particle went, although they are very far from each other in terms of angle. So the question is, what is the telephone line they talk, talk on? What kind of connection they have? This is something that was started by an experimental uh, observation of an effect, which was absolutely unexpected. Um, and, and also rooted in the rig physics program before. Okay, we measure the PT and multiplicity dependence and, and we quantify it. You can also look at it later. So these correlations are important. And one more very global feature I wanted to mention, the last one is in elastic cross sections in proton lead collisions, how you measure basically in elastic uh, cross sections. And that is, Pretty challenging because you need to cover a lot of the. Uh, so you basically you, your experiment needs to notice as much of a fraction of the collisions as possible, not to lose efficiency and not to increase systematic uh, uncertainty. So if you, for example, plot the hadron forward colorimeter energy, this will be a complicated distribution, but. It's a complicated distribution because it's noise. It's the it's a, it's characteristic to your detector, and then at high energy there are the real collisions. So if you want to if you want to make a good measurement, you really have to know your detector and your detector's noise, and you have to measure it. So this is one of the messages I wanted to give that without really much testing your detectors and not knowing the details, it's very hard to make good measurements. So if you place a cut at the right place, then you include a lot of the cross section that you wanted, and then you can extrapolate to the full phase space. Again, these are details that, that may take up another seminar indeed. Some corrections, you have to correct for the noise from non-colliding uh, triggers. You have a contribution from gamma proton uh, processes, for example, a Pomeran exchange between a, a virtual row and um, and the proton, or 
just simply a proton disintegrating in this strong magnetic field of the lead and so on and so on. This, all this needs to be subtracted because we are interested in the hadronic cross section. There is also a pileup, which is collisions happening at the same time. Uh, and in the end, you get a cross section, which is one of the highest cross section ever measured uh, at the LHC. So this is something interesting. LH, many people think about LHC as uh, an experiment measuring tiny, tiny cross sections for uh, exotic processes, but uh, a very high cross section can only also be measured, which is two bars basically. Uh, as an in agreement with the Glauber model, which is again in itself very interesting. So uh, just one word about the future. So you may, you may think, okay, these are all very old measurements. Why do we talk about those? Uh, well, one reason is that nowadays it's really hard to, to, uh, to do measurements on global quantities if the pileup of your collisions, uh, collisions are, are high, so many collisions happen at the same time. On the other hand, many of these measurements were already done in the beginning of the program. But let me show you something that was not done, and it's a global feature. It's connected to maybe one of the most challenging puzzles of the standard model, which is extended uh, air showers initiated by cosmic ray particles and the number of muons measured by Pierre Auger Observatory on the surface. It turns out that the number of muons in these air showers from cosmic rays, the number of muons is higher than expected from any of the sensible models for these type of collisions. So we don't understand why there are so many muons. And of course, these muons are coming from the decay of pions. So we already don't understand then the number of pions in these collisions. And what is the typical collision in this process, in these uh, air showers, is pions colliding with uh, nitrogen or oxygen. But how do we study the pion, the charged pions colliding with a, a nuclei? This is really hard to do in experiment, but LHC can do that. LHC can do that because we can use the zero degree colorimeter to measure charge exchange processes. So basically two protons colliding and exchanging a charged pion and one of the protons turning into neutron and this neutron can be measured by the zero degree colorimeter. What is it good for? It's basically creating for you uh, a collision between a virtual pion and the proton, which is almost the same as a virtual pion and the nucleus uh, in the atmosphere, and at the highest possible energy that you can create in laboratory, which is a TeV range. So TeV range collisions between pions and protons. This is not a pion beam, but a virtual pion. And here you can see just a feasibility plot of the ZDC energy distribution and the yellow dots are these charge exchange processes, the neutrons from, from those, and the open circles are just general uh, collisions with our charge exchange. So, so it's possible to, at least to some extent, uh, um, select these charge exchange events. And then you can again do the analysis of global features on these, for example, number of, of, of uh, pions, which will at some point decay to muons in the air showers and try to solve the muon puzzle by comparing two models and refining models. So all this global analysis story is not uh, over and you can do these very interesting things. So my last slide is about, is it important or not? The top cited papers from CMS. And you can check yourself, I just for fun collected the most cited CMS papers ever up to today. Uh, and I excluded papers that are technical because everybody is citing those and they are not primarily physics, but some describing some methods, how do we measure something? So it's not a directly a physics result. So I didn't include those. I also didn't include those papers that are about tuning some models to the data. 
So the first uh, top cited paper is a Higgs discovery, of course, as you can expect. The second is the Higgs mass. Third is the Higgs decay rates and couplings. And the fourth is a Higgs set seven and eight TV. Uh, the number six is a Higgs mass and couplings. Number seven is Higgs searches. And number 10 is Higgs properties in the four lepton final state. So most of these are Higgs analyses. But look at the other three. The other three top cited papers, the only three that come became the top 10 besides Higgs is nothing else but what I talked about today. The first one is the two particle correlations in proton-proton collisions, which is these uh, long range correlations between uh, particles, it is the ridge. Uh, the second one is the jet quenching in, in lead-lead collisions, which I showed you the two jets, which are very different in energy. And in order to measure them, you really need global analysis first and V2 and underlying event. And the third one is two particle correlations in proton-lead collisions, which are the same analysis as the first one. So you can conclude that these are absolutely important topics. And... Uh, and they are very highly cited. Uh, they have sometimes a deep connection to, to physics, and these measurements really attract a lot of interest. They have applications in other fields of science like cosmic rays, and the future is still interesting for global event properties and their analysis. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Kebor, for this very nice and comprehensive overview of uh, from CMS. So now we are open for questions, comments. So you can either speak up or raise your hand if you have any questions. Yarishi. Yeah, so I had a question about this uh, DN by DN charge by data upon n participants, and you made a comparison between CMS and Atlas. Uh, CMS and uh, star, sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think, yeah, this one. So uh, uh, I guess I was just trying to understand your point a little bit more clearly. So uh, usually, like in global model, this is DN chart by data is uh, some uh, this is c times n participants plus uh, one minus c times n binary, and then c is fitted. Uh, so, did you want to say that uh, it was expected that uh, since uh, CMS is at higher energy, c would be larger for CMS compared that's to star, true. but it's the same. It turns out to be the same, or uh, that's what I wanted to understand. Yes, uh, yes, you. I think you you formulated this very well uh, and explained it better than than I did. So so exactly. So so what I wanted to say is that that we know that the number of binary collisions uh, is increasing with centrality steeper than the number of participants, and so if if there is a, a large contribution from jets and mini jets to the multiplicity, uh, this has to be the root S dependent, as you said, and also centrality dependent. So what my expectation would be is that at LHC, if I go to more and more central events, then I get uh, a steep function, but is plotted because more and more of the binary collisions happen, and they also produce more and more jets and mini jets compared to low energy data. So I think exactly this. So, um, so, so the what, surprising thing was it was almost the same as uh, star. Yes, yes. And, and, and then we of course plotted immediately our results before before even public, being published, of course, for ourselves and compared to RIC data, and we see almost exactly the same curve. If you if you if you don't plot the twenty or the nineteen point six GeV, the stars, uh, the black stars. If you don't plot that, then the agreement is extremely precise. And when when two things agree very well uh, experimentally. And, 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 and you see this scaling, this energy independence, then you, you are wondering 
does that make sense or did I did I find something interesting? Did I discover something or is it just pure accident? Thank you. Yeah, so on this point, I mean, uh, can you tell tell me what's the data for this 19.6 GB? Is it from Phobos? Yes, yes. Okay, so that's why the position is like a little bit uh, larger, right? It has very large error bars there. Actually, yeah, it has large error bars because of the centrality determination mm -hmm. problem. So, so when the when the collision energy is low, then it's not so easy to to cover with the with the your trigger the the most of the cross cross section and then and then the central determination will be not so precise. There is also a scaling factor, so it's not exact. So it's not, of course, the same number. We wanted to compare the shapes. So we uh, so we multiply the rig data by two point one and four point two. These are just just empirical factors to to match the the amplitude of these of these curves to be able to compare the shapes. So they don't have a they don't have a well well founded meaning. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, another raised hand from three four one. So my question is on the plot of uh, d e by d eta uh, as a function of uh, pseudo rapidity. Yes. So this energy that has been measured does it include the photon energies also, or only hadron energy? Um, I think it includes the I I think it includes the electromagnetic part. Yeah. So if I mean in in general in heavy ion physics we uh, I mean determine the centrality uh, from the charge particle multiplicity or from the hadron yield. So how good it will be by determining the centrality from the net energy at mid rapidity, the net energy production at mid rapidity. Mm -hmm. So oh, the energy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. At mid rapidity, I don't think that. Uh, so, the problem is that it's so. So when when we determine the centrality, uh, we we do that for a purpose of measuring something as a function of centrality, and uh, and uh, this something that we measure as a function of centrality is usually. Close to mid rapidity because that that is where our best detectors are for muons and jets and all this. So so we try to usually measure centrality in a way that doesn't induce an autocorrelation between what you measure and your centrality. So we usually try to measure centrality at high eta, uh, high absolute eta, uh, and not at mid rapidity, and. Uh, so, for example, in CMS, we are using the uh, the hadron forward colorimeters between three and five of eta, or we use the zero degree colorimeter counting the neutrons for centrality, and then measure something in the central detector. So, I don't know how I, I cannot answer your really your question uh, about about measuring centrality with mid rapidity energy. Um, I think it's it's not easy to answer that, uh, but that is it's it's not what we usually do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I understand that it's. I mean, one can do using you the central determination using the energy, but uh, yes, but currently that has not been done. The so, the the the, you know, the problem is that people that. People, most people think that it's not uh, uh, advisable to do that because then, then it will create autocorrelations between what you measure and your centrality. And the most independent centrality measurement, most some people think, is the 
number of neutrons in the ZDC, but it has other problems like resolution and and in terms of in terms of physics, it's also complicated because the number of neutrons doesn't tell the centrality uh, without any any uh, any doubt because in very central collisions the number of neutrons are very low in very peripheral collisions the number of neutrons are also very low and in between it's high so it's not a monotonic function of centrality so anyway it's it's, it's a very interesting suggestion i i don't know how to better answer that okay well, thank you Okay, so Ruben, do you have any other questions? If no, no, no. so I mean, so, so yeah. yeah, I saw that so many also raised a hand. So please, yeah, I saw this in your multiparticle correlation slide. I didn't understand. You had this thing about Li Yang zeros. Uh, what was that about? Yeah. Yes, so yeah, I didn't talk about that. It's a uh, Basically, just showing as a cartoon, I don't know where it is now. So it's showing uh, different uh, methods of uh, of measuring uh, the azimuthal angle asymmetries, and and uh, and the development of that is is a historical development the first the first was the event plane method where you measure the event plane so the the the, the large axis of your ellipse for example uh, at high eta and in central eta you measure uh, the amplitude of the modulation of the cosine 2 phi and then then you hope that that these two will be as independent as, as possible and there is some resolution problems and and all this but one problem is that that your azimuthal asymmetry is strongly influenced by by die jets which are back to back in azimuthal angle and they are creating a large asymmetry they are very non non isotropic objects the die jets back to back die jets so so you want to somehow take care of of, of this problem and exclude those but you cannot you cannot, in principle, say that okay, this particle. I, I'm, I'm sure this particle is from the jet, and this particle is from the underlying event. So, so people started to use these two particle cumulants, two particle correlations, which are a little bit less sensitive. But then it was still sensitive to jets. Then they started to use the four particle cumulants, which are basically correlating four uh, groups of four particles, and and since uh, the more particles you have, the more likely that you input particles that are not from the jet, these are less and less sensitive to jet contributions. And the Leon zeros was, I believe, invented for, uh, for the, exactly that, that, uh, that now you, you, you not only uh, include four particles in your, in your analysis, four by four, but you include all of them at the same time in a very general general way and to to minimize the jet contributions now <clears throat> i didn't include the details of how to do that uh, uh, technically i suggest to please look it up in uh, in uh, in uh, I, I cannot comment on the technical details now uh, but but there are a lot of Analysis done with Leon zeros, and and these these are these are trying to exclude these non-flow components. So, so, so these are uh, done by the CMS collaboration itself. So there are papers. I think, I think it's even. I think well, I I don't remember anymore very well, but I think it may come from even earlier times. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Maybe it's an earlier, even earlier method. But I'm not sure. Maybe it's. Uh, but uh, but uh, I somehow thought that as you try to go to higher and higher correlation, somehow your statistical uh, error increases, and that's not the case, is it? 
we have basically yes uh, so you have to think about these statistics but uh, we have a huge number of events at LHC to analyze and I think that was not uh, not a, not a showstopper for this okay. but but you know if I really if I really want to have if I really want to give you a good answer for this I also myself have to look it up what we really did and what was the statistical error by okay thank you okay so are there any other questions or comments um so rishi i think we, we can stop recording and see if there are any questions that people